Hey there people, it's Plague Von Karma here, and for once we have development history that isn't a train wreck. Sort of. Here we have one of the most iconic game companies in history, and one of the most iconic SNES games that made Donkey Kong one of the stars of the video game industry. Donkey Kong Country, and Rare. Today we're going to be covering the history of both. Before we begin on Donkey Kong Country however, I think we should discuss Rare first. I'll spend a lot of time talking about this, as Donkey Kong Country is a culmination of Rare's incredible success in the game industry. Well, not today, but oh well. Originally founded in 1982, shortly before the video game crashed in 1983, under the name Ultimate Play the Game by Chris Hibb and Chris Stamper, few outside of the retro computer community actually know of their connection or even successes of this name. You may know them for the making of Jetpack or Saber Wolf on the ZX Spectrum, but probably not that they later became rare. If you do, it's probably for the graphics. During the 80s and 90s, the Stamper Brothers were known for knocking that aspect of gaming out of the park. They solely developed their games for the Spectrum before outsourcing their ports to other platforms and other developers. I probably worded that very badly, but you get the idea. They worked tirelessly on 18 hour work shifts, only taking breaks for Christmas. This work definitely paid off though, because it made an incredible amount of money. In fact, Tim Stamper talks about getting a custom built Lamborghini at some point in one Get Certain Game magazine. Later, the Stamper Brothers formed Rare Designs of the Future, which is now known as Rare or Rareware, in 1985. The original intention was to develop Ultimate Games without being subject to the buyout. This was also to take a focus on the Japanese arcade market, which was rapidly growing at the time. They were informed of Nintendo by their contractors, which later led to them announcing their venture after disappearing from the industry for a while. Selling the Ultimate brand to US Gold, they went all in on this budding industry as the old brand fell to the wayside with mediocre games. This can be seen in old game review magazines criticising Ultimate Play the Game for their steep drop in quality. During this time period, the Stamper Brothers would begin to work with Nintendo in publishing games for the NES and Famicom. However, this got off to a rocky start. The NES had no asset developers at the time, and Nintendo declined them initially, most likely for this reason. Not one to get discouraged, after researching the NES's hardware for around six months, the Stamper Brothers presented various game demos to Nintendo. Shocked at their efforts, Nintendo would purchase slices for Slalom in 19 1987. This would become a smash hit, selling half a million uh, units under the name VS Slalom in 1986. It would later be ported to the NES in 1987 as just Slalom. This would also become one of the first games David Wise ever worked on, being one of the developers the brothers would have headhunted for in their initial recruitment schemes. You may know him for actually working on Donkey Kong Country, and this is where it comes from. Uh, it would also be the first Rare game ever released on a console. David Wise claimed that developing music for the NES was difficult, as he would have to write the hex values for each sequence before converting them into subroutines. This would be very tedious and time consuming. Anyone who's worked in computer science will know this. Seriously, Rare's success on the NES is nothing to be questioned. Hell, they even fought through the video game crashes ultimate play the game with few problems. Rare would later release masterpieces such as Wizards of Warriors, RC Pro-Am, which is what the first related sell by the way, and even Odyssey such as Jeopardy, which Nintendo marketed as their first board game. It was very weird. Look it up. They soon became a very popular development firm, creating even the first WWF license game on NES, WWF WrestleMania in 1989. They had an unlimited budget, and they would put that to work, getting on to Trade West to use a Double Dragon license to cross over with the Battletoad series. Rare was booming, and the incredible 90s Rare was coming as well. But what about Ultimate? Well, they eventually bought the brand back due to a uh, poor reception around 1989, so around the same time as all this was going on. Soon they would buy Zippo Games, which uh, contacted them to work on the games as well, creating Rare Manchester as well. They developed seven NES games, including Wizards of Warriors 2 and 3, which people said was a bit weird on the quality, and that's probably a reason. They used these rights to outsource Solar Jetman using their newly acquired Red Manchester, along with ports to ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, Amiga, and Atari ST. The ports were later cancelled for unknown reasons, uh, but these have been rediscovered and put online, so you can find those if you look them up as well. Rare Replay also re-released Solar Jetman, uh, exposed it to a very new audience, uh, or today. However, this would be the end of Ultimate Play the Game. It was time for the Stamper Brothers to enter the arcade industry. Nintendo would re-release Solar Jetman on their PlayChoice 10 arcade system as well in 1991, if you're interested in that, after its initial release in 1990. However, during this time period, Rare began to get greedy. 
Developer Steve Pickard claimed that Rare just wanted to get as many games as possible out within a window of opportunity. It's clear as day during this time period as games like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, released in 1989, were published by LJN and developed by Rare. You ever heard of ever heard of AVGN? You know, Angry Video Game Nerd? Yes, yeah, LJN. That's one. <laughs> It's hard to think that a company with the reputation of developing awful NES games would work with one of the better companies of the time period. Rare's games on the NES were rapidly becoming less creative and innovative, but instead of being turned for profits over anything else, the money got to the brothers' heads and their part-time development makes a part-time game a thought was being disproven. What could they do? Soon, Rare will begin to take aim at the SNES as a new money spinner. Investing in silicon graphics as graphics ready computers to make use of their three dimensional t- model technology, they became the most advanced development company in the UK. During this time, Rare's greed will begin to calm down, most likely due to infighting. But I'm not sure though, that's just an inference. The Stafford Brothers will be experimenting on their new toys, making various experimental demos. They worked on the SGI Challenge workstations, making use of their investments. While it's unknown what model they specifically worked on, it could be a Challenge 10,000 during the end of its life period before the Power Challenge took over. I did some research on this. The model would likely be the Graphics Ready model, because, well, Graphics Ready. Regardless, they use their new technology to develop a boxing game demo, although development never progressed far because some good stuff was going to happen from this. Soon enough, staff from Nintendo, I don't have any names suddenly, arrived at Rare and were apparently impressed at the demo, most likely the graphics given the direction uh, Rare would later take. Genyo Takeda from Nintendo would later be dispatched to Japan to convince Hiroshi Yamamuchi to buy what would later be a 25% share in Rare Limited. This stake would rise to 49%, making them officially second party developers at Nintendo. They were like, considered to be key developers at Nintendo by this point, most likely due to the graphics technology, enough for them to offer a catalogue of their characters used for a 3D game. The Stamper Brothers asked for... Donkey Kong. And thus, Donkey Kong Country began development in May of 1993, with an 18-month development cycle. The Stamper Brothers enlisted the help of David Wise to work on the game, from before, and along with de- designer and writer Greg Mayles, who began working at Rare with the Battletoad series. The no similarities in the art style with the original concept art. During this cycle, many ideas will be thrown around from Donkey Kong's design to whether uh, Donkey Kong Jr. will be implemented. The original name was Donkey Kong Monkey Mayhem, codenamed Country, which later got added onto the game name, as we all know today. Developers at Rare scrambled to begin planning for this game, excitement brewing. Nintendo were conf- conf- confident in the game's success, giving a monumental marketing budget of $3.76 million. This is quite high if you convert it with inflation. They were going in, and they were going to ensure that Rare would, could not screw this up, so no LJN shenanigans. They went to the extent of recording a VHS tape for Nintendo Power subscribers, where Josh Wolf would host an inside look at the development of Donkey Kong Country. Rare expanded from 84 to 250 developers, with 20 of them working on Donkey Kong Country during the development cycle. Ideas were thrown around, but not everything could be added. Rare would ensure that, that Nintendo's investment did not go to waste. They went all in on realism, even going out to film how gorillas w- w- moved to see how Donkey Kong should. In the end, they made the character move more like a horse than a gorilla, because they couldn't tell. But in the end, it created the iconic moves that solidified Donkey Kong's character even to this day. There were signs of dispute between Rare and Nintendo, however, specifically with Shigeru Miyamoto. This started with the redesign of Donkey Kong Jr., which Nintendo disliked and demanded to be reverted or changed to a new character. This was honoured, and Diddy Kong was born out of it. Miyamoto was also very apprehensive about Donkey Kong's design, wanting to wear a tie or use a hand slap in some form. Rare, however, wanted realism. They really, really did. Eventually, these changes were appended to the game towards the end of the development cycle, creating a mix of realism while maintaining the original charm. Meanwhile, Greg Bales was working on designs for enemies. He wanted the game to have a wartime feel akin to his Battletoads uh, art style. With this, the Kreblings were born. But where did all this theming go? Remnants existed in the game with some of the enemies still wearing helmets or camo suits. What about the rest? Well, it fell off the concepts, really. This was likely to make the game feel more family friendly and could be why King K. Raw became such a comical villain. Plus, the game's name is a different way of staying stupid ape country. Would a serious toad really have worked? Originally, King K. Raw would be a much more grand ruler named Crud. With a very serious design and very imposing presence, this would have set a much more serious tone over the game. This character would later become Commander K. Rule on 4th of March 1994, according to some documents, 
and eventually King K. Rule, later on a civilian military theme, just fell out of favour. Despite these radical changes, the boss fight against King K. Rule had a single scroll for planning, and barely even changed when implemented. The biggest change was that rather than doing sit drops to try and swash the player in the first second phase, he simply jumped around, most likely due to a lack of animations. Words can't express how far the developers went to push these pre rated graphics. Pushing the SNES to its absolute limits as Rare has always tried to do with consoles. Hell, there's even unused frames of the game to show much more fluid animations for some minor enemies or friends, such as for Rambi. Donkey Kong's kick from DK64 could also be found unused, as well as an animation entirely for turning, hit the water. This game is so much stuff, it's so detailed. While Donkey Kong Country has a, has a lot of development history, it's sadly very easy to sum up, as you've noticed here. The military theme got scrapped, it was meant to be more serious, and there were some developer disputes. Simple, but interesting. What do you think Donkey Kong Country could have been? Do you like the idea of a more serious King K. Rule? What do you think about how the Stamper Brothers went about their business in the 80s? Leave it in the comments. This is Plague One Karma, signing out.